Now today, we continue looking through Luke, and, and before I even read this, let me, let me just do something here. Um, real quick, do we worship worship, yes or no? Do we worship worship, yes or no? No. Do we worship baptism, yes or no? Do we worship the word of God, yes or no? The word of God as in the Bible, the written word, yes or no? Do we worship a cross, yes or no? No. Do we worship an orphanage, yes or no? No. What do we worship? Who do we worship? Are all those things good and important? Yes, even the word. I, I love the passage that Jesus was talking when he was talking. And um, he was talking about the word. He said, um, you, you diligently search, search these because you think in them you have life. But they don't give you life. It is they that bear witness to me, Jesus said. To me. And life is in Jesus. And so, who do we worship? Jesus. We worship God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We worship Jesus. All these other things, as important and wonderful as they are, we don't worship them. Baptism is a great gift that points us to Jesus and brings faith in Jesus, but we don't worship baptism. And an orphanage can teach about Jesus, but we don't worship an orphanage. And even the word of God, as wonderful as it is, we don't worship the word of God except when the word of God is used to refer to who? Jesus. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word is Jesus, and we worship Jesus. Jesus Christ. So we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Luke. We're going to look at still now chapter 2. What week are we in here? We're in week 5, chapter 2. Isn't it great? Um, And we're going to be going through this and just learning a little bit more and today pointing ourselves to what it's all about. Um, When Chris and I met, we entitled this Everything Hinges on Jesus. That that means nothing. We don't worship a title. Um, We worship Jesus. And so I want you just to listen and listen to all these things. And I'm going to, like I have been doing, I'm going to go verse by verse. I'm going to point out some specifics. But there is one key thing that I want to talk about today. And, and that is, anybody have a guess? Jesus. Good guess. Okay? Jesus. It's that simple. All right? I know it's not always the right answer. Like if it has a tail and it comes a tree, well, it sounds like a squirrel, but it's really Jesus. Um, but it's the answer, Jesus. Everything is about Jesus And so I want to read to you from the Gospel of Luke. And while I'm doing this, um, Chris, where where do you, okay. Would you do me a favor and would you set up what will be our little demonstration? Um, We're going to, we'll put the the baptismal font. Oh, somebody did the drapery a whole lot nicer than I did. That was nice. So don't rip it or anything. It's kind of draped around here. And so just ignore Chris. He's going to be sitting down here helping me out for something in a moment. But let's listen to the word of God and let's walk through. I'm going to point out a few um, facts, truths, just to help you understand. um, Because we don't always understand what we read. And we want to understand it. Because the more we understand it, the better we can live it. And the better and the more it will apply to our lives. So do not focus. I know every eye is looking at Chris right now. That's okay. Yeah, he's going to duck. And it's really, it's Jenga. It's just Jenga. Everybody know what Jenga is? All right, if you don't, you're about to, okay? That's simple. So he's simply going to set up Jenga for me right here, and then we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But now, the Gospel of Luke, focus your eyes up here, because we're going to start reading at verse 21. It's where we left off as we had Christmas in March last Sunday. At the end of eight days... Well, we're going to stop right there, okay? Eight days. Why eight days? Because that was what was prescribed by the law of Moses, and you can go all the way back to the Old Testament, and you can find multiple passages that will point you there, even in Genesis. And so at the end of eight days, um, that's what God said. And so Joseph and Mary are following the law of Moses, and they bring Jesus to the temple. So at the end of eight days when he was, guys, cover your ears, When he was circumcised, I know it's like, oh, it just kind of makes you have that weird feeling in your gut. Um, When he was circumcised, he was called Jesus. We don't hear a lot about the circumcision, that's good, but we hear a lot about his name. 
The name for John was really important. The name for Jesus is really important too. It's Yeshua um, or Yehoshua, and it's the one who saves or the Lord saves, like Joshua, the God who saves. And that is his name. And so already we have all these things pointing us to know a little bit about who he is, but he too was circumcised. Now for the Old Testament, the, the covenant circumcision was something where they, when they removed, let's just be adults here, when they removed the foreskin, they believed that they were removing, were removing part of that sinful life. And so that was the symbolism of circumcision, and it was part of the covenant that God made with his people. And so Joseph and Mary bring Jesus, according to the covenant, to have him circumcised on the eight days. He was named Jesus, the name given by the angel, Before he was conceived in the womb. Let's continue now in verse 22. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses. Let's talk about that now for a little bit. Again, in the Old Testament, you can find references to this. Um, There were prescribed rules for women when they had a child. Back then, um, for various reasons, for health reasons and sanitary reasons, and they didn't have the medical facilities and other things, there there were all these rules that were set up to protect everyone. Um, But when someone had a child, in a sense, they were unclean because of the blood. Okay, let's not get too technical, but let's just leave it at that. Um, And so they had to go through a period of time which was like a cleansing for them. For a woman, when she had a boy... Okay? There was a specific period of time that she had to wait until, circum- until circumcision, until they would be brought to the temple, and then a specific amount of time when she was considered to be cleansed. Okay? And so you can go back to the Old Testament and again read all about this. What I found interesting that I actually didn't know before is like the, the period of time I actually forgot it. I didn't write it down. That's the problem when you do all this research and you don't write it down. The period of time for males, I was like, wow, yeah, we're pretty bad. We needed quite a bit of time. Um, but then I, I looked at it and the period for females was actually longer. So I think that means that by nature, we guys are a little bit more spiritual and uh, clean than girls. I'm pretty sure that's what the word of God is saying there. You think I'm right? Yeah. I don't think so either. But it was according to the law. You would wait a certain period of time if you had a male. You would wait a different period of time, an additional period of time if you had a female. And then you had additional days when you would bring that child to the temple for a sacrifice. And most people would sacrifice a lamb and then in addition to that, a bird, a pigeon, or a turtle dove according to the Old Testament and the law. But here's what we hear about Joseph and Mary as they go to fulfill the law and to do the purification. When the time had come for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem because it's a little bit elevated and it's the holy city, even though they were traveling south, going down. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. They would bring this child and in a sense would dedicate him to the service of the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now this is where we get some insight that Joseph and Mary were not people of means. That they were probably poor. Because most people would bring a lamb and a bird, and they would sacrifice these as a sin offering to the Lord um, as a prayer of thanksgiving and to offer this child as a dedication, in a sense, to his service, the first child. They didn't have the money to get a lamb. And so again, Luke is all about the underdog, the outcast, the weak, the poor, the person who isn't privileged, the person who isn't big in society. We've seen that with Zechariah. We saw it with Elizabeth. We saw it with Mary. We see it over and over, and we we see it here that even Mary and Joseph were were not wealthy, but they were faithful, and they were devout, and they fulfilled the law of God, and I think he looked at their hearts, and that's why 
he chose this incredible young gal to be the mother of the son of God. We continue on in verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout. I I need to stop here for just a moment because I can't go into great detail here. um, Just for time's sake. But there's a verse in scripture in the book of Romans that says, there is no one righteous, not even one. We had this discussion come up in our community group the other night. And so if there's no one righteous, not even one, Moses was called righteous. Mary was called righteous. Elizabeth and Zechariah were called righteous, upright, devout, and righteous. And now Simeon is called righteous. What's up with that? Now, we could try to answer that in lots of different ways. I, again, am not going to go into great detail, but some people propose that when you have faith in Jesus Christ, you become perfect and you don't sin anymore. And I was reading up on some of these, some of these arguments and the people, and I'm not here to debate right now. I just don't think that's accurate. I don't think it's true according to the word of God. They have their way of presenting it. And I just don't think that's correct when I look at scripture. Um, because I recognize that we are still sinful human beings who need the grace of Jesus Christ every day. One of the arguments that they used, and, and this was interesting as I'm reading this, they said, of course um, that can't be true that there's no one righteous, not even one, because they said, is an infant in the womb sinful? Of course not. And is a child sinful? Of course not. And I was reading this going, excuse me? This must have been written by somebody who was single and who never taught a day of school in their lives or worked at a daycare, okay? Because parents of children, are your children sinful? Are their parents sinful? Okay, I truly believe that we are still sinful human beings. However, we are called new creations. And yes, there were some people who were designated faithful Because they had faith and were waiting for the promised Messiah. Because they trusted in God. This is before Jesus came. They trusted in God. Zechariah was one of those. Simeon was one who faithfully was waiting for the Lord to fulfill his promise and his covenant. And to bring the Messiah who would set his people free. And because he had faith in the Messiah before the Messiah ever came. I believe he is called Faithful because he trusted in God. It was because of faith, not because of righteous deeds. Now, is this an excuse so that we should go, all right, great, I just get to keep on sinning because I'm a sinner, that's just who I am. No. Romans says, may it never be. Romans chapter six, verse one. Are we to continue in sin? Wait, is that the right reference? I say that and then I've got to check it, okay? Romans... I got a couple pastors over here. You're not, you're not jumping in and, and rescuing me or saving me or throwing me under the dirt. Ah, oh, look at that. Romans 6, 1. I was right. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? May it never be or by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? That does not mean we are perfect It means we do not give in to the sinful desires and behavior because we seek to live a life for the glory of Jesus, a life that's different because we're a new creation in Christ. So let's go ahead and and move on. I'm not going to cover that anymore, but they were righteous in God's eyes because they trusted and believed in the promise that he made that he would send someone who would rescue them, who would truly set them free. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for, for the consolation of Israel. Um, That is something that points us back to the Old Testament again, and it points us back to the anticipation of the Messiah. And the word consolation in Greek is um, periklesis. And if, if you've ever done any studying about Greek, periklesis is this word for consolation or comfort. And you can go back to Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort, oh my people, 
talking about as the Messiah is going to come and all of the references of Scripture that point back to the one who would come. And so waiting for the consolation or the comfort of Israel for the one who would come, the Messiah, to set them free. And the Holy Spirit is often called the paraclete. So we got the paraclesis and the paraclete and the Holy Spirit is also sometimes named the what? The comforter. When the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter, the helper comes, and so we hear in Scripture, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. That was upon Simeon. And it had been revealed to him, that Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. That's the Messiah, the one who had been promised the one who was to come. And he came in the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought the child Jesus to to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said. Now I wanna wanna pause right here. We're not gonna go into great detail about the spirit. We're gonna get there in a couple of weeks when we look more at John the Baptist and his ministry. And we're gonna truly talk about the spirit and how the spirit works in our lives. But did you notice a few things? The spirit was mentioned like three or four times just a matter of verses here. And Pe- um, Pentecost hasn't even happened yet. The Spirit hasn't even truly been poured out in that sense. But multiple people already in the Gospel of Luke have been filled with the Spirit. Do you remember that? And now we got another one who is filled with the Spirit, even before Pentecost. Um, and I love the way it describes it. It says, He came in the Spirit into the temple. I believe the Spirit guided him, the Spirit led him to say, okay, I'm going to go to the temple right now. I'm going to go, and, and I was trying to picture what this might look like, and it's almost like he wasn't under his control. And in this day and age, if someone isn't under their control, what do kids think of? Oh, what's the big rage? zombies, you know, they're not like really controlled. And and so I kind of picture like Simeon just kind of doing like this into the temple. Now, Chris, I think had a much more spiritual perspective. He went to the princess bride. And and so in his mind, and I like his better because it's the princess bride. But um, Indigo Montoya, when he's holding his sword and he's asking for guidance, he kind of was like, I didn't hit it. Um, That was with my eyes shut. I knew it was there. I was guided by the spirit. Um, He kind of had that picture, but we don't know, but he was led by the Spirit. I don't believe this was under his own control. I think the Holy Spirit truly led him and guided him to go into the temple because he had been waiting and he he was promised. You see how nothing is a coincidence? The timing is always perfect for God. I hope we can remember that when we face challenges in our life. Nothing is a coincidence. The timing is always perfect. He was led because he had been told by the Spirit that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Christ, the Messiah, the promised one. And so he's led by the Spirit to go into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, he takes the child and he says these words. And these might be familiar. We call it the nunc dimittis. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. It was interesting that he mentioned glory in this as he's lifting this up. He mentions lots of things. Salvation, a prominent theme for Luke because Jesus is the one who saves. And he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon knew when he saw this child that this was going to be the savior of the world. That information was given to him by the Holy Spirit. He didn't have it on his own. And so now he can depart in peace. He's waited for nothing else except that, except Jesus. So he says, my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all peoples. It's for everybody. A light for revelation to the Gentiles, not just for the Israelites, not just for the Jews, the people of God, for everybody. And for glory 
to your people Israel. He says this in the temple, and the glory had left the temple years and years ago and had not returned again. And now Jesus is brought into the temple, and it's not smoke and clouds. Now it's in human flesh. Salvation, the glory of God, has entered the temple again. And so he says, and the glory as he comes in the temple to your people, Israel. We go on, because here are the profound words that we're going to talk about in just a moment. And his father and his mother marveled, and wouldn't you, at what was said about him? Like, whoa. Okay, we knew there was something special, and we knew what God said, but whoa. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother. And um, all of you that have given birth in this room, just curious, did any of you ever hear these words from God before you gave birth? <laughs> Behold, your child, this child, is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. No one's ever heard these words except Mary because it was said about no other child except Jesus because everything hinges on this one child and who he is and who we recognize him to be. And that's what we're going to talk about. Just a moment. But let's finish out here real quick because I want to give um, Anna credit where credit is due. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years. And I love this. Listen to this dedication. Having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, an approximate age, if we remember when they married back then, we, let's give it 13, okay? Give it 13. So at 20, her husband died. Let's say she got married at 13, and her husband, after seven years, died. So she lived... Um, with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84 years old. From 20, it's our guess, to 84, 64 years. And listen to this dedication. She did not depart from the temple. We don't know if she had a role there, if she was a female prophetess, okay? Um, it's what they call her here, and so we believe that was actually a title and a role that she had, and she served in the temple. She did not leave the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. This was her whole life. Is that the calling for each and every one of us, yes or no? No. But is our calling to have her same commitment, passion, and dedication, and love for the Lord? Yes or no? Yes. And so let's figure out how can we, with our jobs and our hobbies and our lives and our families and our children, still give credit where credit is due and put Jesus first and foremost, make him the center, and make everything about him as the cornerstone of our lives? Well, we can do it with prayer and with fasting and with focusing ourselves on the word of God and worship. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God. This is, again, no coincidence. She was brought. And to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And that's where we're going to stop for today. Now let's just, what is this all about? What is the key point? The key point, and Simeon recognized this, is everything, everything, everything hinges on Jesus. And it's, it's just what I want us to remember. And let's not use flowery language, okay? But let's acknowledge this. Let me ask a question. How many of you can lose sight of that from day to day. Lose sight of that everything is about Jesus. And I, I can. How many of you can be distracted by your work and get so consumed that you just kind of don't give Jesus the credit he deserves? Will you raise a hand? How about your children? Anybody? 
get so focused on them that, you know, it's just harder to do. I spent, and, and I've talked about this before, Sarah's the most incredible blessing, by the way. She's not here because her brother passed away, and I'm packing up the kids as soon as we're done, and, and uh, I'm driving to San Antonio for his funeral this afternoon. Um, four o'clock, so I need to be in San Antonio at four, so we've got to get out of here soon. So you're like, well, then you should quit talking, PJ. Um, but this is important. But I've talked about my devotional life before I got married and before I had children. And I would spend every single night, two to three hours, reading and with worship music and journaling and praying and meditating on, on scripture and just worshiping God. And I, I, have, I have books and books filled with journal entries. Since then, I've journaled about, since I've had children, I've journaled about six days. It was every time... Um, it wasn't even every time. It was when I had a specific call or I was contemplating something like planning a church. I journaled for a, for a whole hour once. Um, but I mean, I used to do two to three hours every single day. And this was until two and three o'clock in the morning every single day. And I love my boys and I love my wife and they're incredible, but I don't do that the same way. And so I need to figure out with my station in life, with a wife and with children, how can I truly still be centering my life around Jesus and be digging into the word of God so that I can know Jesus, the word of God, and be filling myself up with everything that is him. And I want to encourage you to do that as well. I send out those little Lenten devotionals. By the way, y'all may not know this, but I can track who opens it and reads it and who doesn't. And we are on the average anywhere between 64% and 72% of the people that I send it to open it up. Two-thirds of the people open it up. And then about four people print off the Bible verses. Four people print off the Bible verses that we make every single week for you to post on your mirror, for you to be able to share and to remember every single day. We have four people on a good week. One week we had three. Somebody was probably sick or out of town, didn't have Wi-Fi access, whatever. Um, this isn't judgment. This isn't condemnation. I struggle with this too. But if Jesus is the center, if it's all about Jesus, if everything hinges on Jesus, the rise and the fall of many, wow, the rise and the fall, everything in all of history, doesn't, it doesn't hinge on whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Baptist, or a Lutheran. Nothing of that matters. Christianity is not about that. It isn't about baptism. It isn't about orphanages. It isn't about the word of God. It's about Jesus Christ. Everything hinges on that. And so this is just a little demonstration for us to help us to remember this. There's lots of different things in our lives. Would you agree? And this doesn't even come close. And would you agree with that? This doesn't even come close. But it's really easy to go, this one really doesn't matter so much, you know? Um, you know, it's like right there, but nothing changed for the most part. Because maybe that's uh, the fact that, you know, exercise has got to come in here somewhere. It's got to be a little bit more significant and more important. Uh, maybe this is what color shirt I wore today so that y'all would stay awake. Who knows? Um, that really doesn't matter. It, my life does not hinge on that. And so I can remove all of these. And does it change the structural integrity of my life? No. My life is still focused. And my life is still sturdy, as sturdy as Jenga can be. And that's the way I feel sometimes. But then you get into things like my family. Oh, no, let's, let's do working out, okay? Like how I take care of my body. Okay, now that's a little bit more precarious. Did you see things starting to wiggle a little bit? And so how do we take care of ourselves? Well, that's a pretty significant piece, but I'm still here, right? My family is pretty significant and important. Now, these are, are when you start to get, it gets really tough because you pull one out from over here and, and you go, wow, we're still good. We're still good. And I could even remove something that's 
Wow, that one's tight. Oh, boy. Okay, here we go. Is it going to topple? What would that be? That might be like bringing our children and teaching them about Jesus and about the faith and as significant and as important as that is, but we, we struggle with that sometimes, and, and so our life isn't about how well we do that. We can still exist even without that happening. There's always one piece, and as you take out other pieces, there's always one piece that's going to make the whole thing crumble. And so like right now, if I try to take out this piece right here, um, it's going to topple. And, and I probably should have taken out that one first because Jesus is not on the third layer. He's on the bottom layer. He is the foundation. He is everything that we're about. And try to take that piece out and it, there it is. There's the piece that everything depended on in that little scenario. The rise and the fall of many stood on the shoulders of this little wooden block right here. And so for us, this is Jesus. The rise and fall of many, because it doesn't matter politically where we align ourselves, and no matter how important even uh, some of the moral things in life are and how we view family, those are important pieces, but they're not the central piece that everything rises and falls on. There's only one that can bear that burden, one that can carry that load, and that is Jesus. Everything hinges on Jesus. And that's all that we want to be about. Who is he? What was he? And how can we make him the center? And as wonderful and important as all these broken pieces, remember everything hinges on that. We can feed orphans, clothe orphans, teach orphans. Teach them a trade, by the way. Have you taught Aaron a trade yet? You need to send them to that orphanage in Haiti. They're teaching their children trades. So, you know, he's nine months old. You, you, you better, better get moving pretty quick here. He could be a sumo wrestler. There we go. Okay, you start working on that with him, all right? <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we can do all these wonderful things for orphans and incredible things, but if, if we haven't given them the cornerstone, if we haven't given them what it's all about, then we've given them absolutely nothing because everything rises or falls and depends on Jesus Christ as the foundation, the cornerstone of our lives. And so I just want to encourage us in our lives. We're gonna get busy, and we're gonna get busy with good pursuits that are really sometimes even good things. But let's never get so busy that we forget that the rise and fall of many depends on one, salvation, eternal life with Jesus, or eternal life separated from God for all of eternity, you know, eternal, for all of eternity. It rises and falls on one name. And that is who is Jesus? And what do we believe about him? And then when we believe that, he starts to change our lives. So I just want to encourage you to continue to make Jesus the center. Take some time today and open up a scripture passage. And if you don't know where to go, I sent an email on Wednesday and it's got an idea so check it out and see where it goes and open it up and read it because it's going to talk about restoration because that's what Jesus wants to do when he enters into our lives. And so everything's about him. Let's live life that way and let's dedicate our time that way.